Hi, everyone. Here we are for another episode of Be Heard, Women Empowering Women. And I'm so excited today to have Diane Gilman, the Jean Queen. Um, I welcome Diane. And she was uh, QVC and Home Shopping Network's top personality after age 60. And the thing that uh, motivated her was blue jeans because at a certain age, we, our bodies change. Uh, Diane, introduce yourself. Oh, hi. So um, <laughs> Diane Gilman uh, retired from live television, but deliberately to try a whole new territory called being a Silverella influencer. I like that. I feel, yeah, I feel that honestly, our um, generation is so underrepresented. And when you watch cable TV, if you were a young person, the first thing you'd say to yourself is shoot me before I get old. I, I Because every commercial is about going into old age, feeble, diapers, <laughs> taking tons of and drugs. Medicines. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. which is the exact opposite of me. So I know. And you know, Diane, I, I might be a little younger than you, not much. I'll be 75. Everybody is. Everybody oh, come on. Is. Oh, come on. I just turned 78. I mean, well, that is. Honey, I'm 75, a, so it's not that big. A long tunnel to, to look through, and it's kind yeah. of amazing because yeah. it feels like it was like uh, my life was a minefield and somehow I avoided, uh, I, I was able to suss out or avoid any major explosions and losing limbs or anything. I but, so you know, relate it wasn't to easy. that. And I bring up our age only because when we were in the decades of the 60s, 70s and 80s, yeah. it was uh, survival of the fittest. Women were be they're still being killed, but they were domestic violence was not being recognized. I was um, but, in that situation. And that was not I, it. I, I, I the only thing. Come on. I think it, it just being a businesswoman. That too. Um, it was really it was really unique that in the field of women's fashion, every CEO was a man and none of them trusted talent. They wanted to hire you for your talent, but talent was so ephemeral mm -hmm. that they wanted to crush it the minute they got it because they so couldn't rec really recognize it. And that, you know, for a woman like me where it was all talent and I lived and breathed fashion, I love it. Um, you were easily duped and easily taken over. On the other hand, yes. from my childhood, which was extremely difficult because of my father and his actions towards me, I just kept looking for a father all my life, right? Yes. And so one business partner after the next would be fiscally abusive or mentally yes. abusive for control. And it was just this endless hamster wheel until finally, and, mm -hmm. and not coincidentally, uh, when HSN got a new CEO and I had just turned 50, I think I was 58 and a half um, and had been there for a while already, 20 years. She was a woman. Yay. My career shot straight up. I went you to bet. her and said, I have a fashion invention. This may sound crazy to you, but I really think it's going to work. And she said, yeah. yeah, as a woman, this really makes sense to me, a middle-aged jean with different measurements in the industry. Oh, and that is how I got my big break with my once in a lifetime kind of light bulb moment. But you were saying in the beginning about going for a minefield and surviving. And, you know, my first book was called Raised by Wolves, Trapped by Demons. Because my Whoa. Parents, I know my parents were the wolves and my first two husbands were the demons. Well, all, a lot of men in my life were demons. And okay. Yes. And I was held back and I was demeaned and I was emotionally and physically abused. 
And well, I was emotionally and physically abused. Yes. And at the age of about 12, 13, um, the basic point was my father was always after me physically from the age of about three years old. Okay. So I was always defending myself against yeah. him. I spent my childhood with him running around the house with a butcher knife screaming, I'm going to kill you because I wouldn't do what he wanted me to do. And I would lock myself in a bathroom and that's how I would spend 12 hours of every weekend day. And there was no, there was no internet or, or cell phones at the time. So you just sat there staring at a white tile wall. I was and you Pretty really horrible. didn't tell people. Like I know my father. Well, was no, like, I, I went when when I got into high school, um, there was a guidance counselor and I said, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but my father is I'm gonna say it in adult terms. Yes. After me, in a, inappropriately physical with me. Yes. And you know, that was the 50s and the 1950s and she called my parents and said do you know what your child is saying about you she's lying and yeah, that was great going home go. from school that night yeah and so my my parents decided because they didn't want me working and even though I showed an obsessive promise for for fashion at a very early age three or four uh, they decided that they should put me in a mental institution until I was so miserable that I changed my mind. And then, and this was now 1963, they were going to do an arrange. Then when the mental institution <laughs> thing didn't happen. My father's brother talked him out of it. Oh, but yes. then um, they decided to lock me in my bedroom, serve me my meals in there, and find a man, do an arranged marriage, mm. and get me impregnated immediately, and that would be the end of my delusions right, about delusions. fashion. So your mother... Died. It was so scary. So I scary. My mother horrible. agreed. But my did mother she agreed. Did not believe that your father was doing those things? Did she not believe you? discussed it ever, ever, never brought up. But she saw it. I mean, yeah. it was no. so apparent. That, that and so that. when I, I found out about the mental institution when I was 18 and 19, and I thought, I've got to get out of here. This is really scary. And you know, and your, your, I parents, your parents left. are supposed to teach you your coping skills, your core beliefs, you. your identity. And nurture you. Right? With you. <laughs> and there was, it was so, you know, and you grew up yeah. almost the same time I did. I'm three years yes. older. Yes. So what was on television? My favorite uncle, Leave It to it's Beaver. <laughs> All of these housewives with the heels on doing housework <laughs> were such a quirky but happy family kind right. of show. And my, work. yeah, my thing was more like the Adams family. And so yeah. I developed a huge, um, a huge distance from anybody around me because they weren't leading the same life. I was leading a double life, which is really difficult. Being a teenager yeah. is difficult enough. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had to leave. And for years, way into my 30s, I always had nightmares, wake up screaming that my parents were after me. Like I would have a nightmare that I was grocery yeah. shopping yeah. and went and opened the trunk of the car and they were in the car with a giant like gunny sack and put it over my head and dragged me out and took me prisoner. And I mean, I had those kind of. Well, they had taken hostage. you prisoner for yeah. your whole childhood, yeah. your teenage years. And I know what that's like because every dream I had was crushed. I thought I was going to. I wouldn't crash. let them. I would not well, let them I, I crush just my was, dream. I, I it took me a long time. But my Me too. existence, a little different, is the fact that um, my father, who thought he was Italian, 
found out later, he didn't find out, I found out later he wasn't because he's adopted. Um, he would not let go of me. He didn't want me to date. He College was out of the question. The Peace Corps, yeah. service, anything I brought up, a job promotion yep. that was going to send me to Los Angeles to work for Capitol Records, like all these things. But I was too naive. I just didn't have the emotional strength to defy him. So I did what a lot of women do when all the other doors are shut. I got married. And I got married uh, absolutely to get out of there. It was an escape hatch. And it was horrible. I just got out of, I just got out of there to get you're out lucky. of there. And I, mean, get, I don't mean it to took get a job. You know, you're not lucky, though, not li- if your life is yeah. fueled by anger. And this that was my fuel. I was yeah. so angry. Mm. And I asked myself this question again and again throughout my life. Why did I get the parents I got? And, you know, I just did, Maria, I just did a um, a 78th birthday podcast on my podcast called Too Young to Be Old, YouTube. Yes. And it was called, I titled it Conversation conversations with my younger self Hmm. and I went back in time and what I said to myself from the age of one to let's say 15 was it's not your fault because when you've got parents like you or I had Mm -hmm. their word is God they feel they are a hundred percent correct a hundred percent of the time and you're always left feeling bad child inadequate child, rebellious child, difficult child. And then when I, my conversation with myself in my latter teenage years through my mid twenties was basically get the hell out of there, escape and don't look back. And I lived like a nomad for about 10 years. And when I came to New York, it was much easier to just sort of disappear but you know marie um i never went back to my family i never spoke to them i was terrified somehow they would you know get me and when my father passed away i was i believe 45 Mm -hmm. they were older parents to begin with so um i decided to go back for the funeral And uh, my mother would never see that I wanted to try and make amends with her. She just decided that I was after their money, of which they had none, totally delusional. (laughs) But by that point in my life, I had introduced Washable Silk to America. I had my name on the wall of every department store in America, Diane Gilman collection. I was in every local newspaper for spring, summer, winter, fall, da 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 da. What did my mother say when somebody said, aren't you proud of Diane? She should have married a Jewish doctor. Oh, that I'm was not it. Surprised. I'm not surprised. That was it. I just said so, the other day to someone, <clears throat> people have been trying to kill me since before I was born. And the reason I said before I was born is my mother, I had given her a journal at the end of her life so I could have it after she died. And she, uh-huh. didn't, want to, she didn't want to write in it, but she wrote a few things. So she, when she died, I read the journal and there was a chapter that said, how did you feel, and I'm the firstborn, how did you feel when you found out you were pregnant with me? And she wrote in this journal, well, we didn't have a lot of money. So I kept jumping off the steps and I took some hot mustard baths in other words, oh she told God. me that she tried to get rid of me and knew I would read that. Okay. So I was always, yeah, yeah I was always told that my, my reach was beyond my grasp, that I wanted things that weren't possible for me. They couldn't send me to college, that I couldn't go away. So when I'd get hurt, you know, so I had to like learn that I was stronger than they taught me I was. Well, when when I was at my father's funeral, I found out that my French teacher in high school, I was adept at languages, and he knew that I loved fashion. I lived and breathed it. He went out on his own 
and applied for me and got me a four-year scholarship to the Sorbonne, which would have, of course, completely changed my life. I would have been bilingual in the number one language for fashion, French. I would have interned with Dior or Saint Laurent. And my parents intercepted the letter and burnt it. And I found out when I was in my late forties and it was, you know, the, the, her, my mother's attitude was like nothing like, yeah. You don't know how much this resounds with me when I was five. I mean, you you know, unbelievable. And so I would say the two major challenges in my life were number one, my family and Mm -hmm. the, the lack of love, the need for obsessive control. Right. Um, the absolute disinterest in my talents or my happiness. And the other thing would be just when I thought, okay, I've really fought so hard my whole life. And I finally made it even to my standards. Like, okay, this is good. Mm -hmm. I did something good for my generation of women, the the baby boomer gene. Mm -hmm. And I did something good for myself and, live uh, live in a lot of my dreams live in my life my best right. life i get diagnosed with stage three breast cancer yeah. and it was like now you gotta be kidding me here uh, but um did you get a mastectomy I, did you have a mastectomy but frankly i did too that was not even emotional for me i think that i went through the whole treatment which lasted about two years, all told, between the mastectomy, the bus replacement, all that stuff. And, um, you know, I I did it like an out-of-body experience. I think I was just robotic. I know that uh, the guy that I lived with for 20 years died of cancer. And so Mm -hmm. I was mortally terrified of not only cancer, but chemo, because what he went through it yeah. was, and he passed in 97. So they they knew, you know, nothing like right. they know today about chemo. It was just like being bludgeoned with a right. hammer. Um, I remember saying to myself the night before the chemo started, okay, Diane, this is not a dress rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Like you cannot afford to use any of your energy feeling sorry for yourself or feeling scared or not or saying um no because I had so many people around me saying oh don't do chemo just Mm -hmm. do green drinks and yeah Yeah, okay perfect and um I came out of the other side of cancer so much more prepared to live the rest of my life productively I I Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when you are a fashion designer and you live in Manhattan, which is all about fashion, unlike Mm -hmm. most of the rest of the world, Mm -hmm. and you're living in a penthouse overlooking Central Park, blah, 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 blah. And everyone is saying, oh, Diane, you had another great show on TV. You set another record uh, financially. You live in a bubble. When you get cancer and you're sitting there with a hundred other women waiting to get an infusion, or you're going that morning to the hospital to get your breasts whacked off, um, you start to realize that cancer can teach you a lot of valuable lessons. It was, for me, the great leveler and equalizer. It taught me how to be empathetic Mm -hmm. and compassionate. It taught me that there there are situations in life, and honestly, growing older is one of them, Mm -hmm. where you're just one of many. That's it. You're all at the same level. And I, um, I never look back on the cancer with any bitterness. No. I look back on it and think, bravo to you, Diane. You took a terrifying negative and made it into a positive. And whenever I think about it, I 
I only have I only have positive thoughts. You know, I had um, an incredible doctor. The surgeon was incredible, mm-hmm. and she's now the head of all cancer surgery at Mount Sinai in New York. And I only got to see her and I got speed railed in, um, partially because of my presence on TV and the doctor I knew who got me in there, but just partially out of luck. And Mm -hmm. uh, she looked me up and down when she met me. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, you look like a totally healthy human being to me with a localized disease in a part of your body if we have to take it away that you don't need. And I thought, Good for, bravo. Yeah, that's Holy you, God, I got the right person. Let me interject because I, I, I need to put this part in. Since we're talking about breast cancer, I had no problem. I handled whatever problems I've had with my body. And there have been many, and like you. And I remember her saying, it was like a lumpectomy. Oh, okay, a lumpectomy. And then she said to me, I asked a female surgeon also, she said to me, do you mind waiting a minute though? I didn't get this one test back. And I, I really, it's you no know, all out in the waiting room. So she calls me back in and she said, Marie, I, I hate to tell you this, but it's a very aggressive type of cancer. And there's more of a growth than we thought. So I'm going to t- do the mastectomy. And I said to her, do a double. And my yeah. husband could not believe that. I said, oh, absolutely. Take them both off. And then, unfortunately, yeah. I had not done the research about breast implants that I should have. Had breast implants that caused me infections and surgeries for three oh years. Oh, my God. So what I did a couple of years ago, the last time I had an infection, <clears throat> I told my plastic surgeon, I said, take them out. I said, I, let me look like a 10-year-old boy. I don't care. I am not going through any more of this. And he did. So it's just roll with the punches, I guess. But thank God I did. For me, I, it, I had always wanted to get a breast lift. I never had large breasts to begin yeah. with. You know, a B cup, yeah. not, not a big deal. Um, and I had no emotional attachment to it. But when I got the inserts, Mm-hmm. It was, and, and then finally I got all of those horrible drains out. That was the thing that drove yeah. me nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought, wow, this is what a breast lift is like. I And it was yeah. good. I yeah. have to say, it, you know, the surgeon chose two plastic surgeons for me, and I got to choose the one. I, I chose one who was like, one of them was very showy guy on Park Avenue. And I thought, screw that. I don't, I don't want some star. And the other guy was very staid, but had been in the neighborhood forever, was three blocks away from me. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it, it, when you are faced yeah. with mortality, it really and truly is, that's like climbing Mount Everest. Yeah. Whoa. Was, uh, that and like was I, yeah, and I said, amazingly I, scary. I have been in many life-threatening situations, both health lies and with men and at yeah, car accidents. Me too. And, you know, I'm supposed to be here. And what I want to do is also ask you, and this is a branding question because I am trying to brand myself. I'm very new at this. So after the breast cancer, I imagine you had to rebrand yourself. Am I right? Did you have to rebrand yourself after your breast cancer? Well, I had a huge active fan base of about 650,000 women. Mm. And I remember when I got the news about cancer, I asked the surgeon, I said, can we, could we wait about two weeks before we start chemo, I have, because she sort of oversaw the whole thing. She's Dr. Alyssa Port, genius, written five best-selling books on breast mm-hmm. cancer, New York Times. She said, yeah, we can't wait much longer than that. So I go down and I have to give a speech and basically say, I'm going to take a year off television to have a new career, saving my life. Please don't forget about me. Let me introduce my substitute. 
So uh, the network doesn't really want me to say anything. They sort of want me to disappear, but that's absurd. So I give the speech after they've gone through it. Next day, I, I call my assistant and I said, I don't know if I did a good job with my speech. What's on Facebook? And she said, oh, about 80 responses. And I said, 80? Because, you know, HSN has a Facebook page. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, Diane, 80,000. <laughs> and by the next day, it was a 130,000 messages of love and wishing me well. And I think because my message with uh, fashion was always, forget about the younger woman. We should have our own fashion brand and I'm doing that for you. And yes. I'm wearing it every day along with you. I, I so agree. Kind of a seamless highway into reintegrating myself. And then when I stepped away from live television to do podcasting and social media, that message was so ingrained in me and so much part of my belief system that I think my biggest challenge was knowing that a lot of the teleretail QBC HSN customer had sort of aged out Mm -hmm. They did not have a real direct attachment to social media. So I had to reintroduce myself mm -hmm. to a whole new audience. And I reintroduced myself with the skills I learned while going through breast cancer treatment, compassion, kindness, empathy, and wanting to build not a nuclear family around me, but uh, a family of women around me. Yes. All of us going through the same like challenges, which included, you know, one in every three women are going to have cancer within their lifetime. One of every two men are going to have cancer yes. within their lifetime. So mm -hmm. it's not like you're alone, but how do you get to these people and yeah. offer them a message of hope and inspiration yeah. and in aspiration to a better life. So I think because I had started that focus, even while I was selling my own fashions, which I loved and I'm wearing today, of course. Um, I carried, I was able to carry that forward and, yes. and like you, for me, social media, at least being very active on it, is new. I take it as an adventure, but I I think my whole challenge now is integrating the fashion end of me for older women, which virtually nobody else does or cares about. We're we treated like we're disposable with um, an audience that really and truly seeks a better, more active, more comfortable, more productive life as they grow older that nobody teaches us right. we let can me, have. Yeah, My let God. me interject this because I said we have a lot of similarities. Um, 2020 pandemic, I had an immune disease, not only also getting over breast cancer. My husband has Parkinson's and he was going into stage three. I found myself being mean to him, new that it was depression, I knew. And I contacted yeah. a therapist on Zoom and she was the one that encouraged me to write a book. And she said oh. every day when he shuts down, cause he would not speak to me after four o'clock, he was silent. I would go in and write a chapter. And I, to segue off that and reaching women, I got such response to that book raised by Wells Trap by Demons that I started the podcast, Be Heard, women empowering women which you are on right now right and this and is what we need to oh i, want I to ask started you about the new book i started the podcast off my second book Same which thing. was written <laughs> from a slightly different point of view of someone who had climbed mount everest a zillion times and just yeah. didn't think at the yeah. age of 72 i was going to get hit like that but let me tell you a dream I had 
and I had this dream the night before chemo. I can't even believe I slept the night before chemo. <laughs> so I, my favorite car in the whole world for me was my little trench coat beige VW bug. I dreamt <laughs> I was going down a rural country road with wilderness on both sides. And it was super pebbly and rocky and bumpy. Mm-hmm. And I had this feeling I had to get somewhere. Mm-hmm. I ha- And I had these dreams all the time, like constantly climbing stairs and never getting to the top. Okay, <laughs> so I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and suddenly oh. I hit what looks like a wall, but I look up and it's literally a perpendicular mountain that comes to a needle point on the top. I back the car up, I gun it. I go up a little bit, I fall back down. I back the car up, I gun it again. I go up a little more and come back down. And then I think to myself, well, what would you even do if you got to the top? You just (laughs) tip over the other end and crash. And I got out of the car and grew into a giant Mm -hmm. and the mountain became a sharp pebble that I stepped over. And that I believe would summarize the rest of my life. Oh, that's a great metaphor. You have to grow. Yes. You are, you are in some ways very much in charge of you. So if you see a problem, if you see a scary situation, Better to look at it from a giant's point of view, yeah. like eagle eye point of view, and see the whole terrain, than look at it from a tiny point of view where it looks insurmountable. Yes. And so that dream, I, I've had dreams like that before that aren't just a dream, they're sort of a message they from are. the spirit yeah. world. I relate yeah. to that because I always I took dream, it so seriously. I always dream about not being able to find my classroom, my car keys, where uh-huh. I park yes. the car. Yeah, like the years you've got to take the final yeah, I mean, and you can't find the classroom. Yes. <laughs> We're so alike. And in my first book, I wrote about in my second marriage, well, it was actually the second time I married this guy. Oh my gosh. And uh, a Liz Taylor moment. I, uh, it was, I said, it was like Sisyphus going up that mountain with the chain and the gods would just push him back down when he reached the top. And that's how I felt about my ex-husband. And until I got that mindset, which really took a long time before I got that grit, that um, strong will that knew I could overcome anything, nothing was going to change. You know, you have to find that within yourself. Don't you agree? You have to find it. Totally. That. Yeah, it's in you. You're not going to get it from a man, a husband, an employer, anybody. It's in you. And before we run out of time, how would you advise our listeners to take a chance and reach for their dreams, whether they're in midlife or beyond? You know, um, that is interesting because everybody said to me when I said, you know, the thrill is gone. I I really want to leave teleretailing. I've been here 30 years. I could do it in a coma. I am so used to it, but that doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. And I'm going to be 78. I mean, if not now, when? I want to try something else. Now, I've developed my communication skills on TV. I don't really feel I had them before. I like being in front of a camera. I like the girly stuff, the makeup, the hair, mm. all of that. And I love have building a female familial audience and Mm -hmm. I want my legacy to be helping women live their best life so I felt I had no encouragement when I Mm -hmm. left I had a lot of people very angry at me like Mm -hmm. what do you mean you're leaving well, you're a money and maker. <laughs> as, you, as you would if you're yeah. the meal ticket, yeah, right? Exactly. And they're losing the meal ticket. Right. And I thought, what do you want for the rest of your life? And that would be the question. And I wanted my heart to beat quickly again. I wanted to get excited. I wanted to feel like, oh, my God, 
I did it. Like, I, mm-hmm. I will say that my podcast, Too Young to Be Old, which is rated on YouTube, we were just named to be in the top 80 of podcasts for females over 55. And then we found out yesterday, Marie, mm-hmm. we are now in the top and that's fantastic. G. And mm. I thought, right that's on, to me. Diane. Yeah, right right on. on. Of course. Like, I felt yeah. when I when I made that decision, and I know nothing about electronics or the no. internet or you know, yeah. I just know about communication. I thought, my God, this feels like going to the top of the Empire State Building, putting a bungee cord around your waist and yeah. saying, yeah. Hey, bye-bye. I'm going to jump off. You know, I I so understand the excitement of that. And I know that anybody that read my first book that has reached out to me has touched them. There's something in their life as a woman that they related to in my book. But the marketing on my own, trying to get that book out there was mind boggling. And that's when I decided, look. If you if you live to be a hundred, this means you're in your last quarter. You got to get the messes out to these these women, and that's when I started the podcast, which I'm teaching myself as I go. But I have 25 episodes. Me 26. too. <laughs> but thank you oh, so I much. Oh, I think for I've today. only done about 15. But oh, you know God. what? I'm going to go look at no all of them. No matter what. <laughs> You've got, oh, thank you. Um, you, you. Look at the one that's my solo podcast, because I usually do it with the guests, yeah. but the one that's conversations with my younger self. Yeah, I'm gonna I think you'll one. really, really relate to that. I um, am going you to know, post it. There too. need to be, oh, thank you. I'm going to share There needs it. to be mm-hmm. more of us, Marie. There I need know. to be more women who are entering our, what I call our third act, yeah. And deciding to do it in a grand way, in a exactly. big way, in a public right. way, in a helpful way. And, you know, I always said, I hope my legacy I, is after I'm, I'm gone, my name is mentioned and people say, and then you oh my forever. God, she helped me so much. Diane so or much. Diane was so kind. So we're going to wrap what? it up because I'm going to get thank you. But thank, thank you, you for, for this opportunity. Let's, po- uh, let's share each other's podcast. That's the way to do it. I love there. it. Okay. Right, I'll let. get back to you. We'll do this again. All right. 